Roman Rudnitsky is a pianist. He's joining me. He's an American pianist of Ukrainian descent. Uh, we'll talk uh, a lot about uh, his background and his performance. And matter of fact, uh, we do have a performance that you will see at the end of this interview. Uh, Roman, uh, a pleasure to have you. I have had the opportunity to record a couple of your concerts here in the city of Quincy. Right, yeah. It's been, I, it's been very nice performing there. It was, uh, I've done it twice now. Yeah. Great, uh, great musician. You have traveled the world, and we'll get to that uh, in just a second. You continue to travel the world. Your focus is classical music. Let's talk about, um, I suppose, let's talk about your background. I had mentioned you are Ukrainian. That's right. I, I say, for, yeah, because my parents came from there. My parents had quite a career of their own. This is my son. My father was a Pianist, composer, conductor, my mother was a very well-known opera singer there, you know, before World War II. And they were on their second tour in the U.S. when World War II started and they had to start a new life. So, yes, I was already born here in the U.S.A., in New York City. Your background, as far as musically, you kind of said it. Your parents were involved in music. It was, oh, yes, absolutely. See, we're, they're all in the same field. I and, and, and I have a younger brother who's, uh, who's cellist. That's right. We were all in the same field. And so it was a very natural thing, you know, to uh, start studying young and so on. I started uh, piano lessons when I was four years old. I grew up in Toms River, New Jersey, which is, uh, I went through school, uh, through high school, grade school and high school there. And um, my father started me originally, but for a very short period of time, I was four years old. And then he realized I needed other teachers. So I started going to teachers in Philadelphia, which is the closest large city then. Um, and I took violin lessons. Still was my second instrument. I never was a professional at it. I, but I got up to, a, I would say, kind of a lower middle level. Uh, uh, Ten years or so that I studied uh, violin. And in some of my earliest piano recitals, I would play a couple of short violin pieces within my piano recital while my father accompanied me. But I gave my first full recital when I was seven years old. And it was in our home. And I have one image in my mind of about 50 people sitting in our living room, uh, you know, listening to that. So, uh, yeah, I've been doing that for, for a long time. Later, I went to Juilliard. That was already, um, you know, at the end of high school. And so I have Juilliard degrees. Um, and, uh, you know, the concert started to... Um, you know, multiply as time went on, and um, to the point where now I've I've played in about a hundred countries, and uh, I've played also on over seventy cruises, also on Cunard and PO ships, and uh, that's been continuing to this uh, to the present day. Uh, I played with many orchestras around the world. Uh, I played through U.S. embassies, also uh, in about fifty countries, uh, as a kind of a cultural ambassador. And um, uh, I was a prize winner in about 10 uh, national and international piano competitions when I was younger. In addition to all my traveling, I also was for many years a university professor of piano and music, mostly at Youngstown State University, Dana School of Music in Youngstown, Ohio. I was a faculty here for 39 years, uh, and I retired in 2011, but I was five years at two other universities before that. I was at Indiana University, Bloomington. Uh, which is the largest music school in the world. I mean, even then, there were about 1,500 music majors when I was there. And then I was a year's artist in residence at the University of Cincinnati College Conservative. So you can say I was 44 years a university professor of piano and music, in addition to traveling around with concerts. And I had people substitute for me when I had to go. So I came and went pretty much as I as I did. But I retired here from Youngstown in 2011, so 13 years ago now. Um, you know, but I still live in this in this area with with my family and concerts continue. I don't feel I'm ever going to retire from giving concerts, at least as, uh, as much as I can help it, you know, so <laughs> that continues. <laughs> and I, I need to ask uh, your influences and we can go back and maybe even, I mean, I suppose your parents were big influences. Well, initially, yes, of course, of course it was. And as I said, I had, I had several teachers uh, as time went on. I would say the teacher that influenced me the most was my teacher at Juilliard, uh, Rosina Levine. She, was, she had been Van Cliburn's teacher. You know, when he won in Moscow in 1958, the Tchaikovsky competition, at a time when things were very tense between us and the Soviet Union, the Cold War and all that. And here was this young kid from Texas, uh, all applehood, motherhood and apple pie, you know, going and wowing them in Moscow. I mean, he got a ticker tape parade down Broadway when he came back. Can you imagine a classical musician doing that? It's never happened since then. She was very much in demand. And uh, so I was, I was fortunate to uh, be able to um, uh, 
come and study with her. She was, I think, my biggest influence. There were some others that I worked with here and there, master classes. A very famous uh, German pianist, Wilhelm Kempf, who was known as, as probably the foremost Beethoven specialist, invited me to attend his master class in Positano in Italy. This was in 1965. And that was the occasion of my very first trip to Europe uh, at that time. I mean, I did other things too when I was there, but uh, that was another kind of an influence, you know. So, um, and then, I mean, there's some some performers, you know, who uh, in certain repertoire w were kind of models for me, you know. Uh, Vladimir Horowitz, for instance, just as a general sort of, you know, virtuoso. Um, Arthur Rubinstein, uh, Chopin, uh, Walter Gieseking, who's an impressionist, Debussy, and Ravel, for instance. So in certain repertoire, there were a couple other performers that were my influences in that sense. So I guess that's the best way for me to answer this. One of the things I think you had said at one of your concerts was you use the word, and maybe I'm mistaken, but if, if my memory serves me well, and it doesn't always serve me well, yeah. but you mentioned classical and classical music and improvisation. I didn't think those two went together, so explain that. What I was mentioning at that time was that uh, in classical performance, up until somewhere in, in, in the 19th century, in the time of Franz Liszt, it it's sort of started to go out of, out of fashion uh, among classical performers. Because up until then, uh, that was one of, the, one of the main things that a classical performer had to do well. It wasn't just to play something prepared, but to be able to improvise. And... Uh, all these people, I was specifically talking about Beethoven at that time, but really through the time of Franz Liszt, this was still very much in use, and then it started to kind of die out, so uh, we don't do that now, uh, and it's not been really around for about 100 years. I mean, improvisation really only exists uh, among jazz pianists, you know, but it used to be a, a very important thing in classical performances. I didn't think, like you had said, you associate at least I associated improvisation with other styles of music. Yeah, right. That's right. Yes, yes. Yeah, we just, you know, we learn pieces from the printed score. Of course, you know, we interpret it. And what what is interpretation? It's the intention of the composer filtered through your personality and understanding of the music. That's what interpretation is. So once you do it, and if your audience has had some sort of positive experience from what you did, well, then you kind of pretty much done your job. You know, there's slightly different approaches and someone can say, well, I prefer this person, or I prefer that person, that's okay. You know, but uh, the thing is that that's what interpretation is. That's why we, meaning all of us who go, you know, to music schools, that's why we take theory and music history and performance practices and historical periods and all that sort of thing so that we can learn and uh, uh, how as much as we can uh, to bring uh, something authentic to our performances. It isn't, oh, just play it any way you want. It's nothing chaotic like that. You know, you, br you bring the knowledge of the style, but you that's that study that you've had for years, and when you've absorbed all that, and then apply it to whatever you're performing, that's then what brings on the interpretation. Because otherwise, it's just, uh, unless you play it, or anyone plays it, it's, it's just on a piece of paper. We are actually going to a piece that uh, you performed at the Thomas Crane Public Library in Quincy. It's a piece by Frederick Chopin, and it was arranged for piano, uh, originally performed with an orchestra, correct? The piano, that's right, called Krakowiak. It's a one movement piece for piano and orchestra. Um, yes, that's right. It was, it's a piano and orchestra work, very, very, very seldom played. And I made a solo piece out of it, as I did with several other concertos as well over the years. That's right. But it's a very rarely played piece by him. And uh, I don't understand why it's not played more often, you know, uh, with orchestra or whatever, because it's just as good as any other piece by Chopin. I guess I'll leave uh, folks with this, and maybe this being the last question before we go to the performance. Do you ever search out a piece simply because it hasn't been played often? I like to play unusual things, uh, and, and there's so much written in the piano repertoire that, you, that any one of us can only do a tiny fraction of any, uh, everything that's been written. But I do like to do unusual things, seldom performed things, uh, things that I think are valuable pieces and I think that audiences would enjoy. I always talk about the uh, things I play as I did at this concert, and uh, people get a little bit of insight, uh, a little bit of knowledge 
uh, what they're listening to, especially what they don't know. You know, it's like oral program notes. And um, yeah, but I, I do enjoy playing unusual things and rarely play things if it's good music, you know. I'm going to have you maybe address those musicians out there that um, maybe haven't taken the first step or maybe have taken the first step but haven't uh, gone or gotten to the level of, say, a performer like yourself. What um, can you say that would encourage them to continue? Well, first of all, you have to believe in yourself, you know, uh, and have a goal for yourself. Uh, Work as hard as you can, study as much as you can, try to learn as many things as you can about music, not just playing your instrument, but about the other aspects of music. Uh, all those things, as I mentioned earlier, the, the things you learn in music, history, performance, practices, theory, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, if you want to be a performer, just remember, it's an extremely competitive world, and it's very, very hard to make any sort of career out of it, and you have to also define the word career. Unfortunately, only uh, as I read many years ago, only 1% of the total population supports any of the fine arts, whether it's going to museums, classical music, or whatever. So it, it, that makes it very, very hard for people to have a quote career. And many of them have to do something else uh, to have a steady income, which may be completely unrelated to what they do. It's really sad. I think it's getting worse every year because all the Juilliards and, uh, and the other conservatories and music schools around the world are graduating excellent people. And you wonder, well, what are they going to do? I mean, they'll do something, but it isn't what they were dreaming about. Um, it, it's sad, you know. We don't have music education in the public schools like we used to. We're not educating young kids. Uh, we, we, uh, you know, when I was teaching these music appreciation classes, I was doing my little bit to uh, increase audiences, quote unquote, by introducing this subject to these students who knew nothing about it. And, and if they liked it, and I got many uh, nice comments after these classes, uh, that maybe they would tell their friends and maybe I did my little bit to uh, increase that audience pool. You know, they would go to some other concerts. Many of them had never even gone to a classical concert. And I had a requirement they had to go to at least four, you know, during the semester of their own choice. And there were plenty to choose from. But And many of them were attending this for the first time. And, and they, they had these preconceived notions. But when they actually went, they enjoyed it. So maybe by spreading the word to their friends, you know, you, you might get other people do it. So I was doing my little bit, but I think so many other people need to do something like that too, because we do need to increase increase these audiences. It's discouraging sometimes, you know, uh, and I've run across this in my own uh, in my own travel. Sometimes, you know, a, a, nor a local organization would love to have me play, but then they say, well, you know, we just don't know if we can get an, an audience, a decent audience. What a sad thing to hear, you know. So we all have to do our little bit, you know, to... Uh, you know, you do because you have to, you have to go beyond these stereotypes that that, that people have. Some so when they hear the words classical music, they go, "Oh, it's all stuff." Everyone's in white tie and tails. They they get it from the media and the music. No, no, it's not like that anymore. Not the way it used to be. But that's in a kind of an image, which to them says that equals boring. You know, like that. But once they hear the music, it's so much different. Because I, I, I a lot of that occurred while I was teaching those music appreciation classes. I opened these doors for these people and then they got a lot of feedback they really were glad they took the class and now they could function you know they knew something about the music they knew something about terminology you know i can understand you know if you know nothing about classical you go to a concert and you look at these composers names and words like allegro and and and, and uh, andante and you don't know all this this is well you know you kind of feel lost but they got some of these tools you see during the class and now they were able to enjoy this a lot better I say we all need to do our little part to to try to encourage people in our circle of influence, you know, that this is something good, you know, and this is something which is la um, uh, uh, has lasted through the centuries and passed the test of time, you know. So please experience it. It'll, it'll enrich your lives, you know. Just open your minds and your emotions and yourselves to it, you know. Just try it. On that note, I think that's a perfect uh, time to uh, end the interview portion of this program, but certainly uh, folks will be in for a treat um, again with the performance that uh, was recorded not so long ago in Quincy at the Thomas Crane Public Library.